The reason I'm excited about neural MMO is a lot of promise in uh, training uh, large models in reinforcement learning settings so that you can meta learn general intelligence behavior such as exploration, exploitation, uh, cooperation. And I think uh, having multi agent is a really good way to generate open endedness so that you never get stuck anywhere. Uh, so as agents get more capable or smarter, the environment around them gets more difficult because it's all the other agents that are also getting smarter. And so the idea behind neural MMO is to create much more realistic, much more complex, much more behaviorally complex uh, training environments for reinforcement learning. Hi guys, uh, my name is David. I'm going to keep this pretty brief and informal, and I think the meat of it is going to be uh, Q and A afterwards. So I want to uh, talk about neural MMO, which is a uh, an environment for reinforcement learning that I've been working on along with, as you can see, a pretty a bunch of contributors. Then I want to talk about why I'm excited about neural MMO and some of the forward looking work that uh, I'm currently working on and take questions. Neural MMO is an environment for reinforcement learning. And uh, just to review briefly, reinforcement learning is a, a setup where we have an environment and we have an agent it, with uh, deep reinforcement learning. The agent is parameterized by a neural network, but really it's whatever kind of agent you want. So you have an environment and an agent and the agent uh, interacts with an environment in an ongoing manner. It receives observations and some kind of a reward, and it uh, performs actions. So this is a really good setup for any kind of real-world applications where uh, you have repeated interactions with the environment, and as you interact with the environment, you change the environment. It's a much harder problem than supervised learning, where someone just gives you a training set and you just get to... Uh, classify or you know uh, complete or do something with the data as it's coming in without it changing the underlying distribution. If you actually go into RL, and now a lot of RL is around <clears throat> using reinforcement learning for tuning language models, but if you go into the more intuitive RL and simulations, what you find is that most, I would say like 80-90% of RL research is working on uh, games like Atari, uh, the Atari suite, there are other environments, but they're all pretty simple. And it's pretty cool that uh, by knowing nothing directly from pixels, you can get computers to play video games, but it's just like a far cry from what uh, I think we need as far as realistic environments if we want to train uh, agents that are generally capable and generally intelligent. So then the question is, well, what is the right environment and how do we build it? There's a bunch of people that have a bunch of opinions. Here's what I think is really important. Uh, I think you want complexity. So you want behavioral complexity. You can't just be moving a paddle back and forth. You want uh, for there to be really interesting, complex behaviors that the agent has to discover via exploration uh, and uh, distinguish between uh, other complex behaviors that are not interesting or not productive. The environment uh, should be interpretable. A human should be able to uh, understand what's going on because as you're training these things, uh, so much is going on. It's really hard to know. Do you have bugs? Is the agent learning? What is it learning? So having environments that are intuitive for humans, uh, like video games are a great example, uh, is really valuable. And then you want the environment to be configurable. So you want to be able to change parameters, uh, change settings, like how big is the environment, how, how many objects are in it, any kind of thing that the environment, any decision that the environment is making, you want to be able to configure it. And uh, ideally, uh, the environment is procedurally generated so that you don't need to hand design the world. You can use code to generate the world, and that lets you train over various randomized or uh, various parameters for the environment. So you can generate, say, maps of different sizes with different amount of obstacles or different uh, resources. I also think that uh, it's really important for the environment to be multi-agent. And I'll get more into why I'm uh, really excited about multi-agent uh, settings uh, a little bit later. I think most interesting environments have other 
uh, complex uh, entities in it that are changing things or in, that you're interacting with. As an independent researcher, or and this is also true for academic researchers, you want the environment to be computationally efficient. Hardware compute is uh, expensive uh, and now hard to find. So you want to put your GPU cycles and your CPU cycles uh, where it matters and not just like making pretty pictures and then trying to uh, parse pretty pictures. I also think it's really valuable for the environment to be open source so that other researchers can uh, take uh, your experiments and replicate them or uh, carry them further. And so uh, these are kind of the guiding uh, principles for neural MMO. This is kind of what most of our, the rest of RL is doing. It's these uh, Atari games or proc gen, uh, you know, video games that are not trivial, but also are not that representative of what we want. You can kind of view them uh, on this spectrum of, uh, you can have pretty simple game rules, like Go game rules are very simple, but produce a lot of behavioral complexity. There's a lot of strategy to them. And then you have uh, video games where the rules are complex. There's a lot of equipment and uh, ways to play and interactions between different players. And that also leads to behavioral complexity. Neural MMO tries to kind of strike a good balance of having a few rules. So some rule complexity that then would lead to great behavioral complexity. When Neural MMO started, who is the, the main author of this project, started this uh, six or seven years ago, no one really was doing any RL in sophisticated environments. Since then, OpenAI, uh, uh, did Dota and uh, DeepMind did uh, AlphaStar, so StarCraft and WarCraft, uh, which are uh, pretty complicated uh, real-time strategy games. And uh, then DeepMind also has published uh, XLand, uh, which is a really cool reinforcement learning environment. Other people are starting to look at this, but these are all large research labs. And the reason for that is it takes thousands of GPUs and weeks or months of training in order to uh, handle these kinds of environments. And uh, one of the reasons for that is uh, a lot of what they're doing is running these beautiful, complex video games in, uh, and having the agent play them. And then they're trying to extract information out of these graphics. So the model has to learn, uh, well, one, you have to like run a pretty sophisticated video game that's rendering these graphics and pay the compute cost for that. And then it, uh, often you also have to process all these pixels to uh, get meaning out of them. I see someone uh, asked about NetHack Challenge. NetHack is another uh, relatively recent uh, addition, and it's an interesting environment. It's nice that it's very computationally cheap uh, and does have a lot of behavioral complexity. It's very disyncratic. Uh, a lot of NetHack need to read the source code uh, in order to figure out uh, how to do certain things. Uh, and it's single player. And uh, again, uh, I'm really excited about multi-agent uh, settings. So uh, it doesn't apply directly. But yeah, I think NetHack is a really good environment for people to be doing RL in and much more interesting than Atari. So Neural MMO is based on a grid world. So it's a 2D map with terrain. There is water, there's uh, walls or mountains, uh, there is little bushes that grow food, uh, there's uh, various types of resources that you can mine. Uh, into this world, you drop a bunch of agents, you, uh, the agents can either be independent or they can uh, be in teams. Um, I'll talk later about uh, a generalization of that uh, with, uh, with like kinship and socially complex environments. But uh, the agents uh, can go around, they need food and water to survive, uh, they can, there's a combat system, there's a, a equipment system so they can uh, forage for resources and mine resources, use them to build uh, tools and equipment that helps them be better at combat and uh, unlocks other equipment that they can build. They can specialize uh, so that cooperation can emerge. Uh, so if you spend, uh, if an agent spends a lot of its time uh, mining rocks, uh, then it gets better at mining rocks and can trade with other agents that are better at uh, harvesting wood. There's a uh, 
And uh, I guess uh, originally the first Neuronimo uh, paper was published in 2019. So just has been at this for a really long time. And uh, Neuronimo 2.0, which is the paper that I'm talking about now, is a big, I wouldn't say rewrite, but like a large refactor and uh, to the original Neuronimo. And it also adds uh, a really important subsystem uh, that I'll talk about, which is the task system. So you can see there's like, uh, there are uh, agents, there's also NPCs, so simple scripted, uh, slightly less intelligent agents that RL agents can interact with. There's different types of combat, there's armor, uh, there's a way to vary the game rules procedure uh, uh, via parameters as well. And the whole thing is procedurally generated. Yeah, you can kind of see uh, the rule system where you there's uh, skills like fishing and herbalism. They let you uh, uh, go and generate consumables. Uh, there's skills like prospecting, carving, and al alchemy that lets you generate armor and tools and ammunition. And then there's combat that uh, the armor and tools and the consumables help you with. The idea is that uh, by having a bunch of different ways that agents can interact with each other and differentiate from each other, you create the conditions for behavioral complexity where it makes sense for uh, agents to specialize and therefore trade uh, and therefore form uh, more interesting social groups. The whole thing is procedurally generated. Uh, so you can generate tiny maps, you can generate giant maps. That's really important for curriculum learning, which I'll also talk about. There is a bunch of tools that let you, that let humans understand what's going on. So you can look at the map from the perspective of an agent or from a perspective of a different, where different skills are useful. So it also comes with a suite of ways to uh, understand what's going on in these environments as their agents uh, become more capable. Um, so NeuralMMO 2.0 uh, uh, is an upgrade that we published in NeurIPS this year. The main things that uh, we changed was one, we made it a lot faster, and I'll talk about how we did that, uh, but uh, training is much, much faster. And then uh, we added a, a multi-task -ta -a system to it. So not only do you have this procedurally generated world uh, with parameterized rules, but also you can give different agents different goals. So you can uh, have one agent whose job it is to get gold and another agent's job is to protect the first agents and a third agent's job is to uh, protect the gold from being harvested so you can uh, define arbitrary tasks for different agents uh, further parameterize how uh, the agents behave based on what goals you give them uh, another thing that we did is uh, joseph has been running competitions for neural mo for the last few years and uh, the winners of these competitions share their solutions with us. And so we uh, uh, included baselines from some of the prior competition winners. So this is uh, a network architecture from uh, the winner from uh, the competition two years ago. Uh, and you can see these things. If you've done a game playing RL, uh, this will be reminiscent of the Dota model, but you can see uh, these networks can get pretty complicated and there's researchers iterating on baselines so that other researchers can start with uh, something that's already working. I see a question, are all tasks PVP? No, uh, so one agent's task could be gather as much gold as possible. Another agent's task could be explore as much of the environment as you can, or go as far away from your spawn point as you can, uh, or build a uh, level three sword, which requires that you first harvest some wood and uh, get enough wood to then upgrade to better mining uh, abilities and then mine some gold and then build a sword. And then there's a follow-up question, how do you assign tasks to agents in competitions? I'll talk about the competition in a sec uh, in a little bit, uh, but that's a great question as well. One big thing that we uh, did with Neural MMO is uh, focused a lot on making computationally efficient and uh, also open source from uh, basically the start. And the way we did that is, uh, it's pretty cool. All of the relevant game state 
is stored uh, stored in uh, flat tensors. So it's stored as NumPy uh, tensors behind the scenes. And then all of the game logic is written as, in Python. So as a game developer or as an environment developer, it's really easy to go and uh, add new features or change game rules or debug and understand what's going on. And as the game is changing state, we basically mirror the state back into these flat tensors. So that uh, when you need to compute observations for each agent, all of that is done via a really simple query over the NumPy tensor. So if you know the viewport of a particular agent, you can just do a query into these tables and get the observations directly. And uh, the agents get game state as vector, uh, as uh, basically tensors as well, so that you're not spending any compute trying to extract uh, data out of pixels. You're not having to learn what things look like and what they look like from different perspectives. So it, it's extremely fast to simulate this uh, and uh, gets it into the realm that I think is accessible to uh, academics and independent researchers where you don't need thousands of computes. Some questions that are coming in, queries are matrix multiplications. No, they're not They're not even matrix multiplications. They're just range selections. So if you are uh, trying to do observations for an agent and you know it's XY coordinates and you know it's a viewport size, then you can just say, I need to get all of the tiles uh, within this uh, range uh, as uh, observations. And then after you do that, you can, uh, from the tiles, you can see, well, here are all the entities that are, that I just selected. Let me grab all of those entities out of the NumPy array as well. So it's a set of uh, efficient uh, queries over the tensors. And then is there human interface for playing this uh, for transfer learning? There is a, uh, not, uh, there has been in the past, the most recent thing uh, gives you replays and some, uh, like you can uh, do a little bit of keyboard control, but it's not a really good setup. The newer version that Joseph is working on right now is human playable. There's, uh, there's this tension between making games that are fun for humans and games that are interesting for RL that I think is uh, hard to deal with. Uh, just uh, AI is really good at certain things that's hard for humans to do. And so uh, if you design an environment that's fun for humans, often it's uh, either very easy for RL or it focuses on the wrong problems. Have we tried uh, training agents in Neural Memo and applying them to other environments? No, we haven't, but Neural Memo is very much inspired by RuneScape uh, and being able, eventually being able to transfer uh, to more complex environments would be super interesting. I think there would be a lot of engineering work uh, to be able to first uh, transform RuneScape observations into something that uh, an agent uh, trained in Neural Memo could do. But uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I think that uh, transfer to more uh, more interesting games would be uh, something that long term we would want to see from this work. The whole idea of being able to train agents in this environment is that hopefully over time you can transfer to other environments. So I want to talk about the task system and Xland, uh, if uh, people have seen, uh, was one of the inspiring papers for that. Uh, so Xland uh, by DeepMind creates these 3D environments with different agents and uh, a flexible task system. So you can tell one agent that it needs to put its black sphere near uh, or purple sphere near a black pyramid. And you can tell uh, the blue agent uh, that it needs to be able to see the red agent. And so uh, by giving agents different tasks, you can essentially create very different games with the same uh, physical environment. And um, generally the idea here is uh, you want to be able to have many, many, many different kinds of environments so that you can continue generating training data for these models that's interesting. And being able to parameterize the environment only gets you so far. Uh, one maze is different than another maze, but they're still just mazes. At, once the agent figures out how to solve mazes, uh, it kind of, or can no longer figure out how to solve mazes, it stops learning. Uh, whereas being able to have uh, different tasks creates this whole other dimension for uh, potential behavioral complexity. So what we did with uh, Neural MMO is, is, I think, pretty cool. 
we, because we have these tensorized observations, we uh, let you write uh, code, basically Python code, and then we also define a bunch of predicates. So, for example, you can have a predicate of all members within range. So given a group of agents, uh, if all of those agents are near each other within a certain distance, then you get some reward. Uh, or uh, basically, uh, you uh, the task returns some uh, scalar of how well you're doing on that task. So, or you can say, you know, if this group consumes this item uh, as, uh, you know, 10 potions of level five, uh, then you get this task completion uh, reward. And so you can define our fairly arbitrary tasks using either existing predicates that someone's written. And so that way uh, you can automatically generate tasks uh, by combining these predicates uh, using like a, a predicate tree or uh, any kind of anything that can generate a gr a trees or and or conditions of predicates, which we also provide. Or you can uh, just write code directly uh, given this API and then use language models uh, to generate new tasks. The idea is uh, you can then take these tasks and create a curriculum so that when you're training your model, in addition to sampling from different environments, so you can train on small maps and big maps and lots of terrain and a uh, few obstacles, lots of food, you can also now add a curriculum where the thing that each agent has to do is sampled from this uh, potential curriculum. And uh, what that lets you do is generate a bunch of different tasks that the agents have to get good at. And uh, you can think of each, uh, you know, uh, it might be really hard for an agent to learn how to make a level five sword, because to make a level five sword, it has to learn how to make a pickaxe so it can mine minerals. But if the curriculum also has a task of mine five minerals, uh, and also a task of make two tools, then uh, while the agent won't be able to do the sword initially, it will be able to uh, maybe learn how to make a pickaxe by making tools. And then once it's made a pickaxe, uh, it'll learn how to mine minerals, and then it'll learn how to make a sword. So the curriculum allows the agent to explore this really complex behavior space in uh, a much smoother way. The other thing, the way we've structured uh, this uh, curriculum is that you can then feed it to LLMs and basically say, here is some things that the agent currently is capable of doing, generate a few other tasks that you think will be hard but possible for it. And uh, the idea behind this last competition that we ran was to um, actually start with a baseline agent that's capable of learning uh, things, like a, a pretty good RL agent, and focus instead on what sort of tasks can you give it to make it be able to learn faster and learn more complex things. Uh, and the idea was to use language models to evolve the curriculum uh, uh, as a way of guiding the agent in learning through the environment. Um, I'm seeing a question that says, is scoring done internally to the agent or as part of the game environment? The game environment produces rewards, uh, which is part of the RL setting. And uh, so you, you tell the game environment for each agent what uh, its set of tasks, what its tasks are. So you could say agent one will get, uh, has three tasks. They have to get as much food, as they ha have to get five food and they have to get 100 gold and they had to stay alive and each of those and the first task is going to give you you know five percent of your reward the second task will give you 90 percent of the reward and the other task will give you five so you can for every agent you can give them a distribution over these uh, task predicates and uh, then the environment figures out the reward uh, you could also feed uh, an embedding or however you want you can feed the task back into your agent so that the agent actually gets a uh, embedded piece of code uh, and learns that it's like, oh, I should be trying to do this thing. Oh, I should be trying to do this other thing. On the topic of using LMs to evolve curriculums, that's really cool. Have you experimented with trying to infer agent objectives from their behavior? Uh, no, we haven't experimented with that, but that would be a really cool experiment. And then uh, using LMs to evolve curriculums, there's a uh, this was based on uh, a research direction it's called uh, evolving language models. And yeah, the idea is to uh, 
use language models as a mutation operator in an evolutionary setting. So you can basically say, here's a curriculum, here's how well the uh, agent is doing on all of these different tasks. Hey, language model, go and generate uh, mutations to this code to uh, create more interesting uh, tasks. Then you can uh, take a subset of those, the code that actually runs and throw those into the curriculum. And then maybe you can guide the language model to say, hey, that last curriculum you generated was good. Uh, do more of that or less of that. Can agents change their objectives over time within a single session? Agents don't get to control their objectives. The objective is part of the environment, but you can parameterize the tasks to say, get 10 food within the first 30 seconds, and then uh, that objective stops being interesting. And so you can have objectives uh, that are parameterized on time. So you can say, in the first part of the game, your job is to get food. In the second part of your game, your job is to get gold. In the third part of your game, your job is to kill other agents. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you can have uh, objectives that change over time. That uh, kind of covers uh, the neural MMO environment. Uh, and uh, you can think of it as a package of things. It's an environment that's really fast to run and easy to extend. It's a bunch of infrastructure and tools. Uh, so uh, there's code for, there's baselines for being able to train a basic agent in this environment so that you can just iterate on uh, agent architecture or iterate on training methods, or uh, some people are making mini games in this so that you can uh, run specific experiments. There is a really flexible task system. There is primitives for doing this curriculum learning in there. It's a community. Joseph has been running these competitions. I don't know if he's if he is graduating. He's finishing his PhD, so I don't know if he's going to keep doing it. Uh, but he continues to be really excited about neural MMO. Uh, I, I see this as kind of a living project. And here I'll play a little video of the, uh, the one of the la latest replays. Uh, and you can kind of see little critters in here going collecting food and getting water and picking up magic mushrooms and shooting arrows at each other and magic spells and dying. Uh, all of this, this is all a rendered replay. So uh, uh, when we are running uh, learning or uh, evaluations, none of the graphics ever get rendered or generated. This is a trace from a run that we then uh, throw into a uh, replay viewer, and then it generates all these graphics so that humans can then go and see what's going on. I want to pause for questions around NeuroMMO, and then if people are interesting, I can also talk about why I'm excited about this and uh, some more uh, like theoretical, philosophical stuff about multi-agent reinforcement learning and uh, this thing that I'm uh, working on called meta-learning, uh, meta being a Buddhist term for love and a pun on meta-learning. Thanks for the talk. This has been really great. Uh, so I build games and uh, for me, you know, reinforcement learning is interesting as a way of tuning the games, not just of training agents, but actually changing the way that the game presents itself to players or presents itself to agents. Is that something that neural MMO can support where I could actually like make the make parameters in the game environment subject to subject to optimization, subject to change by reinforcement learning? Definitely. That's a great question. And uh, I think uh, it gets into kind of the core of why uh, I think this environment is interesting. So there's a whole uh, uh, subfield of RL called uh, unsupervised environment design. And the idea is, yeah, how do we generate interesting environments? And obviously, uh, in RL, it's for RL agents, I think for you, it's for humans, by being able to tweak different parameters. So uh, neural MMO is highly parameterized. So there is a config file where you can change mo many, most of the settings. And then it's a very uh, simple uh, Python code base where it's also very easy to go and say, oh, I want to parameterize this behavior. Let me add a couple of settings to the config file and then uh, change it so that this behavior depends on these config settings. Uh, and then uh, it's up to you to, uh, uh, you can uh, instantiate games with whatever parameters you want. So it's pretty easy to then have an optimization system that says, okay, let me try this uh, config. Okay, here's the gradient uh, for the config. The challenge with this whole approach, I think, is figuring out, well, when do you know that you're moving in a good direction? When is one 
setting better than another. And for games that are played by humans, I think that requires having some metric of, you know, are humans enjoying this game or are they uh, having fun or is this game interesting for humans? And uh, typically, unless you're running a large uh, gaming uh, environment, uh, it's hard to get that kind of uh, data. So I think the challenge is less about uh, being able to tune the game parameters, which is really easy and very doable, uh, and more about, for humans, how do you get a uh, useful uh, signal about whether, uh, in which direction to tune them. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. That was great. When people are training, when people are using neural MMO to train, uh, you know, to, to sort of figure out, like, how their agents should behave or, like, you know, to train their agents, how does that work? Do Are people running this locally? Uh, are like Or does neural MMO have, like, some public infrastructure where you can where you can, you know, do some rollouts and, and, uh, and, you know, calculate your gradients? Like, how does that work? Uh, how do people interface mm -hmm. with this? When you develop uh, and run experiments, you run it locally, or I mean, I run my experiments on the cloud. So I go rent a GPU, pull the repo and basically uh, run training uh, on uh, a single machine uh, you can run. It's a gym environment. So you can use whatever infrastructure uh, training infrastructure you want. So you can set up uh, RL lib and run a distributed training over many uh, nodes if you have those nodes and you have a cluster, or you can run it on your own machine. Typically, uh, you can get pretty good agent performance in uh, on like uh, 490 in like 10 ish hours and uh, pretty okay performance in a few hours uh, to even see uh, to see that it's working or not on a single GPU, obviously, depending on how big your models are, and uh, all sorts of other things, the speed varies. Mm -hmm. uh, for competitions, we set up we had a, a cluster uh, where people could submit their code, and then we would train your model for a particular period of time. Uh, while, while throwing in a curriculum, uh, like while shifting the curriculum. So we set up some infrastructure for the last competition, but it's not an ongoing thing. And it's pretty, pretty hard to maintain. Well, it's expensive. Uh, I imagine it's public. pretty expensive to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe this is a good time, uh, if it's okay with Sophia, for me to chat about meta learning and uh, where I, I'm trying to uh, like the direction I'm excited about, uh, and then uh, I mean, it's part of that is about what you're passionate about. So, right, <laughs> please go ahead. It's my first time talking about this, uh, so uh, the slides are very simple. And uh, what I would love from everyone is like prodding questions, feedback, uh, because I think this is really cool. But uh, I also want to recognize that uh, it's kind of out out of the mainstream. So what's meta learning? I think one thing that uh, you kind of get to see very quickly if you do deep learning is that neural networks are function approximators. I think it's a really good way to think about a neural net is any function you want, um, you can either write code to build it or you can approximate it with a neural network if you just train it with the right training data. And so uh, the question uh, I'm interested in is, can we approximate a function of an agent that's generally intelligent and cooperative. It should be possible, right? Because all of those things describe a particular function that humans and animals uh, have uh, approximated via evolutionary search. And so when I say an agent, I mean, uh, it's a function that takes a sequence of observations, basically everything that you've seen up to now, and then generates the next action that you can take. That's what an agent is. Uh, it's basically a function. And then when I say generally intelligent, now things get a little bit more hand wavy, but the idea is that given an environment and a fitness function, and uh, so you can think of that as the reward that the environment produces or the goal that an agent has, it's not really that important where the fitness function lives, but uh, given some environment, can the agent learn the environment dynamics, basically figure out how does this world work by balancing exploration and exploitation, basically doing some things so the agent has some fitness and it has to figure out how do uh, I could do things that get me rewards now or I can do things that uh, teach me more about the world I'm in so that I can get more rewards later and the agent has to figure out how to balance those two. And it needs to do that via sample efficient techniques. So it needs to, it can't just 
randomly try things and learn what works. It has to learn techniques like forming hypotheses, testing them uh, based on uh, using its existing knowledge to guide its further exploration. And so if you think about general intelligence as a collection of behaviors that is basically sample efficient uh, learning, exploration, exploitation, balancing uh, in arbitrary environments, uh, it doesn't sound that crazy that we should be able to approximate this function. And there is a famous no free lunch theorem in uh, machine learning that basically says you can't be equally good in all kinds of environments. If your environment is random uh, gas molecules that uh, your reward is predicting uh, where they're going to end up, the algorithm that uh, does well in that environment isn't going to be the, envi uh, the algorithm that does well in a human uh, you know, in a self-driving car environment. Like those are very different environments. And so you don't imagine that uh, you can have a function that's equally good at both. So obviously the environments need to be similar enough to human or to environments that we find interesting, but uh, uh, they could be pretty far away from an actual physical world uh, because even in games, uh, you still need the same kind of thing of like, Try different things, figure out how different objects behave, figure out how uh, different entities behave, figure out what gives you rewards, do more of that, form theories about the underlying workings of the system. Subfield of machine learning called meta learning, where uh, you essentially tr uh, try to learn how to learn. So rather than uh, building an agent that's really good at solving a particular maze, you train over many types of mazes and the agent learns generally, how do I solve mazes? Uh, and so uh, I'm trying to uh, use that technique to meta-learn general intelligence. And the idea there is, can we create a gradient towards increased intelligence? Basically, can we make it so that there's some environment in which there's things that uh, the agent can learn that are not that hard to learn, that the agent is capable of, get, uh, of learning? And once it becomes smarter, once it learns that, the environment becomes slightly harder so that there's something new for it to, again, figure out and learn. So basically, can you set up this intelligence treadmill so that uh, there's always something that uh, if the agent is slightly more capable, slightly better at exploring, exploiting, slightly better at uh, learning new things, that it uh, gets rewarded. My recipe for AGI is if you have this intelligence treadmill, if you basically have a thing that is able to generate training data with a gradient towards increased intelligence, and you train a very large model, kind of like we do with language models now, which are uh, billions of parameters compared to the, uh, uh, the agent that solves uh, Dota that uh, is like 50 million parameters. It's like tiny compared to 30 billion parameter language models that we're building. So basically, if you can have this training data generator, this intelligence treadmill, and uh, train a large uh, model using, uh, and for that you need training infrastructure and compute, I hope and I think that you can get a generally intelligent agent that can be dropped into a new environment. And if the environment is sufficiently similar to previous environments, it can be like, okay, what are, what are my, what's my action space? What can I do? What am I observing? How are the dynamics changing over time? Okay, let me form some, like, let me have some theories about um, how the world works. Let me perform some tests and experiments. Let me update my theories. Essentially, uh, can tune itself uh, like a, uh, an animal or a human can to a brand new environment uh, much faster than traditional RLL, which requires billions and billions of lifetimes in order to uh, master a new environment. How do we set up this intelligence treadmill? Uh, I think we start with a sufficiently interesting environment, and this is why I got interested in neural MMO. It's an environment that is pretty simple, but it's also pretty complex. There's lots of things you can do. There's lots of ways you can interact with the environment. But I think the real key is other agents, because uh, kind of, uh, I think it was uh, Niraj that asked about, can we uh, make the environment harder uh, or more interesting for uh, automatically. For me, the uh, the easiest way to do that is build the environment with other agents so that when you get smarter and you learn some way to exploit something about the environment, all the other agents, which are basically copies of you just under different circumstances, 
uh, also now know how to exploit that thing. And so that thing is no longer exploitable. And now there's a whole, you have to figure out some new way to uh, get an edge. So essentially, uh, this takes a page out of uh, what I think is evolution by setting up a, a red queen scenario where just to stay, everyone around you is getting smarter. And so you have to get smarter too. I think, uh, so I think other agents are key, but I think another really important dimension to this is that the behavior space has to be smooth. So uh, if all your agents are ever doing is playing rock, paper, scissors with each other, uh, you're not going to, uh, they're never going to learn any real complex social behaviors. The game just doesn't uh, allow you to do that. And similarly, if the environment is full of just prisoners' dilemmas, you're never going to figure out how to individually leave the set of prisoner's dilemmas. So uh, the way I think about behavior space is uh, there is a spectrum between cooperation and competition. So a competition is a formulation where each agent is an independent agent that has its own rewards, entirely selfish. And in that space, uh, there's a lot of behaviors that you can never explore because anytime you do anything that puts you at a disadvantage to another agent, they're going to exploit you and you're going to lose. And so there is a whole set of behaviors that you could just never pursue because they immediately get punished. On the other side is cooperation, where all of the agents are uh, on the same team. We see this with Dota and StarCraft, where it's really it's like uh, it's a team of agents against another team of agents. So when you're fully cooperative, the only thing you really have to learn is how to communicate because you already want the same thing. You just need to figure out how do we share knowledge and how do we coordinate action. Uh, another way to think about it, it's really just like one agent with really crappy cognitive architecture where parts of it can't talk to other parts except by sending messages to each other. But the problem isn't that interesting once you've learned how to, once you've learned how to communicate, you're really uh, uh, in a single agent setting again. So the thing I'm excited about is using kinship. The idea uh, is that an agent is born into a world and some of the agents are its brothers and some are its cousins and some are its tribe members and some are strangers, but friendly strangers and some are enemies. So there is a whole spectrum of uh, what uh, relationships these entities have to each other so that you can learn how to cooperate and coordinate with the, uh, entities that are close to you in kinship space. Uh, so that and then learn how to build and maintain trust and negotiate with agents that are slightly further away from you and then form coalitions with agents that are further away from you and uh, essentially explore this entire behavioral space of cooperation. And just like I mentioned earlier with the task system, creating this much more smooth way for you, uh, you can learn how to build a level five sword by first uh, learning how to harvest uh, wood and then learning how to make a pickaxe. Uh, similarly, you can learn how to form uh, complex teams or corporations or cities by first learning, well, how do I just get along with my two brothers, uh, uh, even though uh, you know uh, we love each other and we have mostly the same interests, but also there are the times where we have to share scarce resources. And then uh, once you learn that, learning, okay, well, how do I uh, build a coalition of agents and keep everyone uh, going along the same way? Uh, so the idea is to smooth out the potential behavior space by having a uh, reward uh, kinship. Someone asked, um, is kinship equivalent to aggregation over agent objections within uh, with a single, is kinship mathematically equivalent to aggregation over agent objectives? with a single agent. I don't think I quite understand uh, that. Uh, uh, can I, uh, so ask? basically, yeah. you know, you said if you have multiple agents that can communicate with each other, then that's sort of equivalent to just, you know, having a single, like having just a single agent, right? Uh, my question yep. is with, with kinship, uh, is there some sort of similar principle at play where, uh, you know, you can just have some sort of like a weighted, um, like a weighted average of the objective functions of like, you know, all of the kin agents. And, uh, and then if you had like a single, if you had single agents that were sort of playing according to that objective function, if you would sort of get the same kind of outcomes uh, in training. The way I, uh, the way I'm exploring kinship is via reward sharing. For every pair of agents, 
you can imagine there's some coefficient that says when agent A gets a reward, agent B gets 10% uh, of that reward. You can re rephrase that by saying, well, uh, agent A's goal is to get five food. Uh, therefore, uh, let's give agent B a task that says, you know, 5% of your reward comes from agent A getting five food. So you can denormalize reward sharing uh, by explicitly assigning uh, a bunch of tasks to all the other agents. Uh, I think in that formulation, it's equivalent. Uh, there is something uh, kind of interesting about the kinship model uh, because you can imagine, um, yeah, you can be explicit about what the tasks are, but that requires that that you have explicit tasks, which I think is fine for uh, some environments and maybe less fine for more complex environments where uh, maybe the agent does, uh, has instrumental goals that, uh, so it's like, oh, I need to uh, build a pickaxe, but my, uh, first I need to go get enough stone. The other agent is like, well, I want agent A to build a pickaxe, but I don't actually know how to help them. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, when agent A comes and says, hey, uh, can you help me get some stone? And I'm just arbitrarily reward sharing, then I'll be right. like, oh yeah, I want to help that agent because it's asking me. So uh, if you imagine that there is a bunch of instrumental goals uh, mm -hmm. along the way, and uh, the question is, can every agent model the needs of every other agent or uh, uh, from the tasks? Or uh, is it easier to learn that from just a pure reward sharing? So I think that's one difference. I think another difference is uh, in uh, socially complex environments, uh, when I encounter two agents and I observe them, uh, knowing that they have some reward sharing going on is really useful information. So if I encounter mm -hmm two really tight, uh, you know, two allies, I might not want to fight them. Whereas yeah, I, yeah. if I encounter two enemies, I might w pick one and ally with the other. So being yeah, reward sharing is part of the environment as well. It's not just the objective function. That, that's actually a good point. Yeah, yeah. So my moniker for this, and I'm really excited about it, is uh, I'm calling it meta learning. My claim uh, or my hypothesis is love is all you need. Because uh, I think that the way we got love as humans and as animals. And I think love is a, a generalized cooperation. Lo love is how evolution solves cooperation. Uh, the, uh, if you don't have kinship, if you don't have love, the, uh, you can still do some cooperation, right? You can have reciprocal altruism where it's like, well, we're both better off if we trade and we don't hurt each other. And we can sometimes discover those, but it's really, really hard. And most of the time, you don't actually, uh, you're not able to get out of these uh, prisoner dilemma equilibria. Whereas with kinship, uh, there's a lot of cooperation that is unlocked because you're essentially blending the line between what an agent is. An agent is no longer just a selfish individual entity. It's actually a blend of all the other uh, or many of the other agents in the environment. And so uh, I think that... Uh, this setup, this formulation, is simultaneously allowing you to meta-learn general intelligence because it's creating this constantly changing, open-ended, complex learning environment in which you can train an RL model. And it's also letting you meta-learn cooperation because when, now an agent has a set of skills and behaviors that when it encounters other agents in the environment, and you tell it, hey, this is your brother. It's like, oh, I know what to do with a brother. It's like we share some things and we argue over other things. Or if you're like, hey, you're an ant in an ant colony, uh, that is like, oh, I know what to do in an ant colony. I sacrifice myself for the greater good. I think this approach uh, to me is really promising because it kind of uh, addresses both of the holy grails of uh, AI research, which is general intelligence and alignment. Uh, through one mechanism of uh, reward sharing based kinship. Um, so that's why I got into neural MMO in the first place. I wanted uh, to start with an environment uh, that was supporting this and then uh, add uh, kinship to it and uh, scale up training uh, to see if I can get an open-ended learning environment and train really big RL models in it.